All right, so welcome back, grade tens, for our final Monday together and really our final lesson together. Tomorrow, we have our A1 final exam that can replace your lowest A1 score, but you may be looking at your A1 score saying, I don't really have a low A1 score. This is so amazing. If somebody wants to write a makeup final essay instead, I can have one of those ready for you, but it's going to be an essay prompt that you haven't looked at before. But I can have an essay here for those that want to write an essay instead of an A1 tomorrow. If you're not writing an A1 or an essay tomorrow, you can always sit quietly at your desk and study multiple choice. But I can't have students collaborating in one corner of the room while others are struggling to find their way through an essay or an A1 in another corner. So. If you're here tomorrow, you're here to do some kind of work. Then Wednesday, Remembrance Day, Thursday, final exam. So Thursday's final exam, uh, there's no need to start it at 8.30, but uh, you do need to bring a highlighter and a pencil. And after 8.50, you should be able to get started. And it will be the only thing we do that day. If you finish early, uh, we're instructed to keep you here unless you're going to leave the building. So on Thursday, if you finish the exam early, uh, if you don't want to sit in here basically being able to do nothing because our course is over, then you'll want to have an exit strategy. You'll want to have like, okay, how am I going to either get home or go study somewhere because we can't have you roaming the halls. And if you're in here while others are writing a test, we can't have you in here doing anything to sound creating. So it's a fun week we have ahead of us. So you were meant to do a little bit of review over the weekend for our 60 multiple choice questions you'll see on Thursday. And first thing I want to do is answer your questions. So what questions do you have? Fire away. <coughs> Looks like there are none, so I'm going to give you a little bit of information, and then when I get uh, tired of talking to myself, I'll probably just say, hey guys, why don't you study for the rest of the class then? All right, so you may want to have your notes out, because I'm going to give you some insight into what may be on the exam, so that you have a strategic plan to study. The exam is scheduled to take two hours, but uh, in the spirit of giving you guys extra time, you have extra time. So basically the exam is scheduled so that you should be done at our lunch break, but the extra time would be the after the lunch. Which of the following descriptions of globalization is most likely from an Aboriginal perspective? So one of the things we're going to ask you to do is to take the term globalization that we've been studying all year. We understand it's the interconnectedness of mankind. And we want you to say, okay, here's four descriptions of what they think about globalization. And we want you to evaluate them. We want you to sort through them and say, okay, of these four, which one sounds like it's coming from an Aboriginal perspective? So given what I know about the Aboriginal experience connected to globalization, what might they say about it? Are they going to say like, hey, globalization is fantastic because it led to the introduction of things like horses, and we really like horses. It uh, you know, transformed our culture. So the first question is going to get you to look at four descriptions of globalization. All valid descriptions. But then you have to say, okay, which one's from an Aboriginal perspective? The next question, also known as number two, will have a quote. And again, much of the skill of writing the final exam is not about the, oh man, can you give me who wrote the quote so I can memorize it? No, the quote's on the page. You don't need to memorize it. But what you need to do is to take the quote, which is an argument, and say, what's this uh, argument in favor of? So in order to get number two right, you have to know the difference between, you have to be able to distinguish between hybridization, and I bet you can complete that list. All those other words that go with that, hybridization. Acculturation, homogenization, assimilation, cultural revitalization. So 
Uh, many of them are on page 58 to 62 of the textbook. Go back to related issue one and, and study those terms. Because it's not that number two says, hey, give me the definition of homogenization. But number two is saying, here's a quote. It's an argument. It's an argument in favor of what? So in order to get the question right, you need to know the definition of those terms. So go back over your related issue one terms, like hybridization, acculturation, assimilation, homogenization, and there's at least one question on that. So number three takes the same quote and then has you do some synthetic thinking. Synthetic thinking is, okay, here's a quote, and then which of these four things would be an action that supports the perspective of the quote? So it's very much like an A1 skill in that in A1, we're trying to find an ideological perspective. So here, for questions two and three, we give you an ideological perspective, a short little quote. And the first thing we ask you to do is say, okay, number two, which word is it uh, promoting? And then number three, which action supports it? So again, much like all multiple choice ends up becoming is, it's a matching thing. And matching is one of the easiest things we can do. But we add a, you know, an, an academic twist here, is that now you have to synthetically think and say, okay, if this, then what? If this person's saying this, then what's an action that would support that? Which of these four actions would support it? Moving on. Question number four goes back to related issue one. Actually, the next five questions, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all deal with three sources. And they're familiar sources. The one source is the cartoon of uh, the Disney characters invading the island. The, the, the uh, island, and remember when we saw it the first time, I said, you know what, I'm pretty sure that's on the final exam. Second source is also from the same cartoonist, and it's looking at branding through consumerism. So many of us have been branded. You know, you look at the logos on shoes, you look at the logos on backpacks and hats and things like that. Uh, we are branded. Great day to wear a whole Disney shirt, right? <laughs> so there's a branding there. We have Adidas, we have Nike. So you're going to end up seeing a cartoon uh, that shows a consumer that has been branded by multiple transnationals. And then the third source will be a quote about uh, marketing and advertising and all those great things. So from that, we're going to end up giving you five questions. So, uh, what can you do to prepare for this? I would say that it's in your best interest to go back once again and learn what is a simulation, what is a culturation. Those words pop up here. But much like that other source, you're going to be asked to try to find perspectives. So it's gonna say, you know, the source three, the quote, Whose perspective is that from? Would it be a Francophone? Would it be a Blackfoot? Would it be a CEO? Would it be a Quebecois? So much like an A1 activity with the ideological perspective, one of the skills you'll need on the multiple choice final is to say, okay, I'm gonna read through it. Who would say this? So there's some analytical skill testing happening there. Who might say this? So how do you how do you study for that? Well, Definitely going through your textbook will be to your benefit. Just you know, skimming through your textbook, looking at the visuals, looking at the sources, that'll certainly help out. Just seeing if you can practice finding ideological perspectives. Another part of this set of questions will be about a relationship. So in A1, we do a paragraph on relationships, that's the last paragraph. In multiple choice, we can test the same skill. 
The relationship best illustrated by source one and two is what? So now you have to look at two cartoons in this case and say, how do they connect? Is it a, is it a cause and effect? Is it that they both show the same concept? So understanding language is important, but also understanding how we have those linear cause and, and, cause and effect relationships will help out too. Uh, sometimes we might ask for uh, a relationship like the to what extent question, that overarching theme that you would do in an A1. So here it says which caption would, would be the best headline for all three sources. So usually when we do an A1, we talk about a, a to what extent umbrella question that holds all three together as a set. Now for the multiple choice, we're saying what headline would hold these three together as a set. So one of them, A, says Disney forces the ideas on the world. Now that's only possible if each of the three sources talks directly about Disney. If only the first one talks about Disney and you don't see any reference to Disney in the other two, that can't be it. So you have to think critically about the applicability of all four headlines and say which one which one would work for each of the three? All three of them. Because that's what it's saying. Which caption would be the best headline for all three sources? We're also going to ask you questions like, if the perspectives of the sources were embraced by consumers. So if consumers said, you know what? This is how I feel. What would be the outcome of that? So this is a great set, these five questions. Because it's not about memorization, it's about application of, of understanding. So you need to know simulation and acculturation, you need to understand relationships, you need to understand perspectives and themes, you need to understand what multinational and transnational corporations are, but then you're doing something with it. It's not just recall. All right, moving on to number nine. So number nine goes back to linguistic identity. We talked about linguistic identity in chapter one when we're looking at uh, globalization. We also talked about linguistic nations as our bridge for next year. One of the most common linguistic groups we talked about are Francophones. And they're just gonna give you for number nine four possible circumstances and, and the question is, what would be the greatest threat to a Francophone identity in Canada? There's nothing really that you can study for, it, per se, but there's some critical thinking needed on the exam. And that's the first nine of 60. Moving on to number 10 and 11. Number 10 and 11 would be a set where there's four understandings. So the understandings are, are basically statements about globalization. Things like the term globalization refers to the rise of global capitalism, and then it continues from there. Or globalization is transforming the world into community. Or globalization defined by only by money and goods. So we're going to give you four perspectives about globalization. And of the four, we're going to ask you to group them. We're going to say which two best show that globalization is complex and multidimensional. So if one of the statements says globalization is only about money, then that's not showing that it's multidimensional. So you, again, it's, there's nothing you study for number 10. It's more that on Thursday when you do number 10, you have to read through carefully and say, okay, which one of this one says that, you know, there's an economic dimension, there's a cultural dimension, maybe a, an ethnic or a religious or a political or a social dimension. Which one is saying that there's multiple dimensions to globalization? I honestly, I, I don't want to be rude, but you shouldn't get number 10 wrong. Take your time and you should get it right. It's one of those ones where the answer is on the page. You just have to look at the four understandings and say, which of these four, which two of these four are saying that it's multidimensional? Multidimensional. I guess the key there is to understanding what multidimensional means, right? 
multidimensional means that there's more than one thing globalizing us. It's not just economic, it's economic, it's social, it's political, it's ideological, it's cultural. And then the next question, number 11 says, which one says it's just economic? And if anybody picks for number 10, like say one and two, and then for 11 says, ah, oh, two's only economic, ah, right? Like you're contradicting yourself. So to get number 11 right, you just have to be able to look through the floor and say, which one says it's just economic? It's just things like defined only by flows of money and goods. That sure sounds economic to me. So read through it carefully, take your time. This one says, refers to the rise of global capitalism. So there's a poll to at least two of them to talk about economics. And then you have to say, which one? Oh, this one says flows of people, money, goods, and services. Three of them have economic stuff listed in them. So then you have to take your time and say, okay, looking closer, which one is only talking about economics? All right, the next three questions, 12, 13, and 14, all deal with a uh, cartoon that is in the textbook. It's about media convergence and media concentration. So we did a mini lesson on the media where I ended up taking the textbook and I basically taught you a lot of my social 30 stuff on the media. But for this textbook, or sorry, for this final exam, we're going to have that concept from pages 73 about um, flow of information, the power the media has. We're seeing this in the US about how divided sometimes the media can be, how CNN and Fox will report different outcomes of certain states at the same time. So I want you to understand terms like media convergence and concentration of ownership of media because you're going to see a cartoon and a quote that wrestle with those very things. The quote is talking about Sesame Street being in South Africa and they tell us that story on page 83 of the textbook. That's the story of hybridization. So it will be to your benefit to some extent to go back and skim over the textbook in the next few days. Don't read it to memorize it, read it or skim it to understand it. There is a difference. Skim through it, identify what you don't understand and then ask questions. That's what I, I hoped you did this weekend. So there will be References to things in here like segregation, like assimilation, like hybridization and Americanization again. So lots of those cultural terms from related issue one. We'll also give you some skill-based questions like proponents of the perspective of source two would find the phenomenon presented in the source problematic because of what? It's that A1 skill again. So if you're a proponent instead of an opponent of the ideological perspective, how would you respond? What is the change you're wanting to create? And ultimately, number 14 is a relationship question. What idea or ideas are contrasted in the two sources? So how do they relate to each other? Are we talking about hybridization and colonialism? Are we talking about acculturation and homogenization? Is it a simulation? and media concentration? Is it multiculturalism and accommodation? So if one doesn't go back to related issue one and review the vocab before Thursday's final, you're going to under underperform because there's a lot of RI1 vocab in the R, RI1 section of this test. Lots that come back to that assimilation, acculturation, accommodation bit. Next up, we go to the Industrial Revolution, and we have, for number 15 and 16, we have a chart that looks at child labor. So you don't have to memorize the chart, right? The chart's already there. But you can always go back over your notes on the Industrial Revolution. And then there's going to be a quote about the IR. The first question, number 15, says, 
Which of the following is an accurate summary of the data in source one? Again, nothing to study for that, but what you do is on Thursday, you're gonna be looking at the data and you're gonna say, okay, is the data showing this, 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 or this? What is it showing? It's a matching thing. It's a deductive reasoning. Is it showing me this? In 1818, many of the children working in the factories lost their lives. So now I gotta go up and say, okay, what's it saying about the death rate or how many people get killed in the factories? If I see that, then that's the answer. If I don't see it, it can't be the answer. It's, it's very straightforward. Then number 16, which justification would most likely be given by the author of source two if presented by the data in one? So that's that, that's that relationship thing again. How would this person respond to this? What would they say in response? And that's, that's an A1 skill that we've been wanting you to use in the uh, relationship paragraph all year. So would they defend the factory jobs being created? Would they attack the exploitation? What would they say? Given that they say this, what would they say in response to that data? That's a really good test. Number 17 is a very specific question. We're going to go into chapter eight of the textbook that if you uh, kind of gloss over some things, you'd be like, dude, I'm guessing on it. I'm not sure. So this is one of those things you have to study before Thursday. And what's the topic? It says the signing of the numbered treaties with Aboriginal people from 1871 to 1921. What did it lead to? So the signing of the numbered treaties. So we have to go back in our textbook and look up the numbered treaties and then look at the consequence of signing them. You know, did it lead to integration of native peoples into mainstream society? Did it lead to the opposite, the isolation and segregation of Canada's Aboriginal peoples? Did it lead to the return of hunting and fishing rights? Did it lead to the signing of the Indian Act? What did the numbered treaties end up doing? So, how can you know the consequence of the numbered treaties? Just gotta go back into our textbook and look at what they have on numbered treaties, and then say, because of this, then what? Because of this, then what happened? Next up, there's going to be number 18, a question about the consequences of first contact. Uh, it's gonna read, it is estimated that over 500,000 first peoples inhabited Canada at contact with Europeans. By 1900, only 100,000 remained. Why did we see a decline in the population of, of first peoples in Canada after Europeans came? So that's gonna be straight recall out of the textbook. Number 19 is going to be focusing on um, concepts like white man's burden. So you're gonna see that term again. You're gonna see some of the, basically the causes of imperialism. But you're also gonna see some of the legacies of, of globalization. And you're gonna to need to distinguish between are these four things, are these causes of European imperialism? Or is this a legacy? Is it a cause or a legacy? Cause comes before, legacy is what comes after. Did these things cause it or are these things left behind because of it? Or are they possibly connected to the Industrial Revolution? Are they causes of that? Next up, we're gonna have a quote and we want you to link it to terms like white man's burden again, or terms like nationalism. So the quote is the 19th century theory inspired by Darwinism, by which the social order is accounted as the product of natural selection of those persons best suited to existing living conditions. So there's this quick reference to social Darwinism and survival of the fittest. It's gonna say, from which of those concepts from the mind map above is this idea linked to? All right. By the way, once I get to related issue three, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, give you a chance to go back and study a little bit, and then we'll record a second half of this.
next up, we're gonna have some information about the Aztecs, and you're gonna be like, dude, I haven't studied the Aztecs for years. This isn't cool. But it's not really about the Aztecs. It's about reading comprehension. There's a whole page on the Aztecs, right? And then there's questions about what's on that page. So it's a skill thing. Which statement best summarizes the information that we just shared with you? So it's new information, and we need you to go through it and say, okay, of these four things, what are they doing over here? Based upon the information in the source, in which area was there the greatest difference between this and that? Again, they give you a, a directing prompt, and they say, go back to the source and, and, and find the answer. So although we have a set of questions on the Aztecs, it's 100% reading comprehension based upon what's on the page. And I think I'm going to stop at number 25-ish. Well, I kind of should get through 30 because there's 60 questions. But 25 is the beginning of related issue uh, 3. And it's from chapter 9. And it says, what was the central issue that divided Keynes and Hayek? And they talk about that in chapter 9 of the textbook. You know, what did they argue about during Bretton Woods Conference? And yeah, I think I'll stop there at number 25, and then we'll continue on with uh, related issues three and four after I give you a little bit of time to study what we just talked about. So I might interrupt you right before our mass break and go through another section, and then after the mass break, maybe give you a chance to study a little bit again, and then we'll do the, the final bit after lunch. So there's the first third, if you will, to give you something to study.